This is a podcast by the Business Times, presented by UOB. What is emerging is that blockchain harbors great potential for the financial sector. The distributed ledger technology will allow the encrypted, decentralized storage and transfer of values, and also provides an end to end value chain for digital assets. Suffice to say, this technology promises innovative applications and greater efficiency in a fully digitalized financial industry. At UOB, future proofing banking ahead of blockchain shockwaves is a priority. What are the shockwaves that UOB anticipates? What future proofing in the existing banking systems is their answer? Today we speak with Hang Kun Hao, Executive Director for Blockchain and Digital Assets at UOB to find out. Welcome to the Business Times Future of Finance podcast. Kun Hao, thank you for joining us and welcome to the podcast. What, in your opinion, is blockchain's role in the future of finance? So we are in very exciting times here. And the landscape for finance and banking is changing rapidly because of the innovation in blockchain. Throughout history, there are key moments in the history of banking or finance where things take a certain leap, whether it's technology or you know ideas or investment that changes for the better. First, we have the introduction of the concept of money and lending. And that led us to move away from bartering. Then, of course, you have the concept of compounding and time value of money, which is introduced. And that taught us the virtues of investment. Most recently in the 90s, that's the internet age. And that basically helped us move online into digital banking. So for blockchain, smart contracts and key so-called distributed ledger technology that helps bring forth a lot of new possibilities that previously were unimaginable for banking and will herald the new era of banking and finance. And we see three key applications. First is, of course, the use of blockchain to speed up payments. Second is the use of blockchain to transform and deepen capital markets and the fundraising process that we know. And third is the use of blockchain to create a whole new world of digital assets that we can invest in. It's important to emphasize that all these three transformations or shockwaves of blockchain are happening as we speak and intensifying and picking up pace. Tell us more about the type of blockchain technology you've identified as game changers in the financial services sector and why. So the very first blockchain technology that we identified as a game changer rightfully affects the payment space because payment is the plumbing of the financial system. And we all know that in the background, although we have done a lot of digital payment, a lot still needs to be done to improve. I'll give you a few examples. In the background, in what we call the final mile of payment, it is still requiring a lot of manual intervention to make sure that when we send our funds, whether it's $1, $1 dollars million, it goes to the right person and that it's not used for money laundering, it's not used for terrorist financing, etc. And we all know that when it comes to cross-border payments, it is still very slow, it is still very inefficient, and it still costs quite a bit of money to remit and send money abroad. So the thing about blockchain is its nature is instantaneous. The smart contracts are immutable. They are good records of transactions of payment flows. So we're not talking about using cryptocurrencies for payment. Those are still speculative in nature. We're talking about using what we call central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, for payments. And as the name implies, they are basically defined and set up by central banks to help improve the payment process. So the Bank of International Settlements has said that in its latest survey, as much as 9 out of 10 central banks in the world does various experimentations in different stages with CBDCs. In Europe, Sweden's Reichsbank are way ahead and have already piloted what they call the e krona In Asia, the People's Bank of China takes the lead with various domestic trials of the ECNY or what they call the Su Zi Renminbi in various cities in China. And of course, in ASEAN, all of ASEAN countries, including Singapore, are very in earnest in experimenting with CBDCs as well. So this is exciting in terms of how CBDCs can be used to change the payment network. Here in Singapore, the Monetary Authority of Singapore is also looking into CBDCs and, of course, regulation and oversight. 
Kun Hao, how do you think this will affect the free of rules approach early adopters were initially drawn to? The thing with CBDCs is this. In Singapore, as you rightfully mentioned, the MES has started experimentation with CBDCs and it's important to highlight how much the MES has done and how much we have evolved. Now, back in 2016, the MES in the initial stages of Project Ubin tested the use of domestic easing dollar. After that, that evolved into Project Dumba in 2021, which basically the MES collaborated with other central banks in the world to test the interoperability of the connectivity of cross-border CBDCs. And most recently, the MES announced Project Ubin Plus, which is the global initiative for the cross-border exchange and settlement of foreign exchange FX transactions using wholesale CBDCs. Now, there are many studies under Ubin Plus Some even went ahead to study the exchange between blockchain technology and non-blockchain payment systems. And there's Project Mariana, which is a new cross-border wholesale CBDC study between the MES, the Bong de Fonds, the Swiss National Bank, and the BIS. Now, why am I mentioning all this? It is because it is important to appreciate all this evolution of CBDC projects under the MES. And as in all new technology, whether it's blockchain, whether it's fintech, they're fast developing. There's a lot of risk in all this technology, and this can be unpredictable and Darwinian in nature. So central banks and the MES need to take the lead to define all these CBDC studies, to do all the heavy lifting, to help set the framework for the technology, for the governance structure, for the business models, and more importantly, to provide a very safe sandbox for all of us, banks, and blockchain firms to experiment and build this ecosystem together. I would like to quote MSMD Ravi Menon in his keynote speech, his very exceptional keynote speech at this year's SFF. He said that a key feature of all blockchain and fintech projects that the MES is championing is to achieve collaboration and collaboration between public and private sectors, collaboration between incumbent FIs, banks, and emerging fintechs, and collaboration across borders. And it is this collaboration that is key to success. We at UOB believe in collaboration. And in fact, we are participating in this CBDC project under MAS called Project Orchid. And it is collaborating with Skills Future Singapore to look at using a form of programmable money, a CBDC, to make dispersing of grants to training providers more efficient with lesser manual intervention. So again, you see where this is going. It is all about making payments much more efficient with lesser manual intervention and riding on the ease of technology from blockchain. Still ahead, where does asset tokenization fit into the future of finance here in Singapore? When we come back, we take a closer look at this and what UOB has put in place in their role as custodians of these assets. This episode of Future of Finance is presented by UOB. And now back to the podcast. We're speaking with Hang Kun Hao, Executive Director for Blockchain and Digital Assets at UOB on the subject of future-proofing banking ahead of blockchain shockwaves. Kun Hao, let's talk about inflation as economic uncertainty persists. Fundraising is expected to remain challenging into 2023 as a result. In fact, some are calling it the worst fundraising market since the great financial crisis. How can asset tokenization help in this regard? Correct. So fundraising is definitely getting more challenging. Cost of funds have jumped a lot because the Fed and global central banks have hiked interest rates significantly over the past year and liquidity is driving up. Now, irrespective of all this, in the background, there is a strong push to use this form of blockchain technology, asset tokenization, to transform our capital markets. Now, there's a bit of misconception about asset tokenization. Essentially, what it does is it uses blockchain technology to break up assets into small bite-sized chunks. The magic word is fractionalization. So with all these smaller pieces of assets, bite-sized chunks, it makes the entry to investment lower. It makes basically the cost to investment lower. And at the same time, it makes all these assets more liquid, more accessible, thereby increasing opportunities for investment funding opportunities, and unlocking value. Over the past few years, blockchain asset tokenization has been applied to a whole spectrum of traditional and financial assets. In the traditional space, we have real estate properties, 
high value collectibles like whiskey, artwork, Monet, Van Gogh's that have been tokenized. In this aspect, NFTs are a form of asset tokenization, but I want to emphasize that it should be NFTs of legitimate value and utility, not those of speculative nature. Specifically relevant to us, it is the asset tokenization of financial assets that is revolutionary. And this helps improve the liquidity of capital markets, whether it's equity or fixed income, bridging the gap between private and public capital markets. Yobi has collaborated and is continuing this process with blockchain providers like ADEX, MarketNote to tokenize digital bonds, to experiment with more efficient bond issuance processes via blockchain. So why is this trend significant, especially for Singapore? Asset tokenization is absolutely important for Singapore. Mr. Ravi Menon, he summed it up very, very well. He said asset tokenization has transformative potential, not unlike securitization when it happened 50 years ago. And he said that asset tokenization allows high-value assets to be fractionalized, exchanged securely and seamlessly, and with smart contracts, enable the more innovative use of borrowing, lending, and trading facilities. So if you read the Financial Services Industry Transformation Map, issued by the MES and updated for 2025, you will notice that the MES has reiterated Singapore's ambition to be a fund management hub, but more importantly, to be the upcoming digital asset hub for the region. And having the right know-how, future-proving our banks, and establishing a strong collaborative ecosystem for asset tokenization allows us to ride this wave to be a leading regional digital asset hub for Asia. So in fact, under the auspices of Project Guardian, UOB is collaborating with HSBC and MarketNote to tokenize wealth management products. You also mentioned the explosive growth of digital assets and how it will affect the bank's roles in being custodians of these assets. From where I'm sitting, it looks like banks have to pivot. How significant will this evolution of financial services be? Think about it. In the next few years, if you have more and more assets being tokenized, now whether it's real estate, fixed income, or whether it's private equity, we'll have a larger growing pool of digital assets for banks to manage. Again, Mr. Menon has said that any asset can be fractionalized. No market is too big to assess, and the process can potentially lower trading costs and build more transparency and trust in the banking system. So with all these assets that's been tokenized, these digital assets, there needs to be a very safe, and secure way of storing them. Banks, as you know, are traditional assets custodians and safeguarding of our customers well. This is no different from traditional assets and digital assets, but the process of doing so is very different. This is no longer about locking assets in our vaults. With digital assets, the new digital assets, the important thing about custody is the safeguarding and ownership of the private keys that leads to the access of all these digital assets. Now, we all know that those of us who invest in cryptocurrencies can be a relatively haphazard process where some of us scribble the private key on a piece of paper and then lose it. And then you lose access to your Bitcoin forever. But in the institutional aspect of digital asset custody, the process is much more methodical, much more robust. It is a whole interlocking system of how you store all these private keys offline away from hacking risk, and at the same time, how do you allow seamless, efficient access to exchanges for trading for efficient liquidity? So institutional-grade digital asset custody is going to be a big thing for banks in the years to come, and at UOB, we're studying what the very efficient and secure way of doing this is and how to collaborate with like-minded blockchain services firm to help provide this new service to all clients. We've been speaking with Hang Kun Hao, Executive Director for Blockchain and Digital Assets at UOB on the future of finance. Kun Hao, thank you for the information and the insights. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you. On behalf of the Business Times podcast team, thank you for joining us. We look forward to sharing more transformational information with you next week as you navigate the future of finance. This episode of Future of Finance podcast was presented by UOB. That was a podcast from the Business Times. Send your feedback to podcast at sph.com.sg. Find us on Apple, 
Spotify, Google Podcast or, via the Google Voice Assistant Amazon-enabled devices. For more podcasts by The Straits Times, The Business Times, and Money FM 89.3 you can also download the audio by SPH app. That's A-W-E-D-I-O. This podcast is meant to provide general information only. SPH Media accepts no liability for loss arising from any reliance on the podcast or use of third parties' products and services. Please consult professional advisors for independent advice.